Okay, hi everyone. So in this video we're going to be talking about how AAS works, going through some of the mechanics of how the instrument actually functions. Um, you'll see the, the diagram in your booklet. This is my clearly not very artistic representation of the same thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this video, we're going to, going to go through what the different parts actually do. So label what they are, think about what their role is in, in actually um, allowing the, um, this technique to work. Now, I mean, AAS is a technique that's been around for 50 or 60 years. It was, it was an Australian technique developed by CSIRO in the 1950s. That's one reason that we focus on it in the syllabus, to recognise our, our innovation in this particular area. But also because a lot of the principles that, that make this technique work, work for lots of other analytical, analytical techniques that, that chemists would use these days to identify concentration of, um, of an unknown in a, in a mixture. Okay, so let's start from this side and work our way across. Okay, so what we have over here is a lamp. Okay, so it's an, a light source and it's called an atomic emission lamp. Okay, so what this is designed to do is it produces a particular wavelength of light. Now, so what we have inside here, inside the lamp we have what's called our target element. Okay, so that is if we're trying to identify lead, we would have a lamp that has lead inside. If we're trying to identify cadmium, we'd have a cadmium lamp. A mercury, where we're going to have a mercury lamp. The reason for that is that, we're thinking back to the video that we just watched on um, the emission of particular wavelengths, is that we know that, when, that the electrons, as they do the jump from ground state to excited state in a sample of, say, mercury, that they emit very specific wavelengths of light. Okay? We also know that that wavelength of light is what the atom itself will absorb. Okay? So the, the, the atoms of mercury will emit this wavelength of light, but they'll also absorb that specific wavelength of light to make the electrons do the jump. So what we can do then say is, all right, well, if we've got a complex mixture in a solution of all sorts of metal ions, by targeting a specific wavelength, we know that only that element will absorb. We can basically tune out all the rest of the noise. We'll talk about that in a second with sensitivity. Um, but the idea is that this lamp produces those wavelengths that we need. Okay, so then moving over here, so this is where our, our aqueous solution goes in. So this is our flame. Okay, so the idea being that it will heat up the, the sample. It's designed to atomize the sample. So a complex water-based mixture goes in and you end up with separate atoms of, of all the components in that mixture, the water is kind of evaporated off, so you're just left behind with all of the things that are dissolved in the water in separate atomic form. Okay, and so then, you know, mercury atoms are separate from lead atoms, are separate from cadmium atoms, and so on. Okay, and so that they're in the flame, so the idea is that then they're present in this area here. We've got our lamp that's producing those particular wavelengths we know our mercury, for example, will absorb, and it's shining through the flame. Okay, in my diagram you can see the flame's kind of a bit underneath. But the idea is that, that where that satam, sat, sample is being atomized, those wavelengths are traveling right through it. Okay, what we have over here is we've got a lens, we've got a prism, which is also called a monochromator. One color, monochroma. A monochromator. And then we've got a detector. That's totally an E. Okay. Um, so what we have is that we've got, we're producing the wavelengths that we need, we're passing them into the sample, and then all of this business over on the other end of it is to collect the wavelengths that pass through and detect them. Okay, so we have a lens to be able to focus the light and pass it along to the prism, which is our monochromator. Okay, so the idea is that we have this triangular prism that's able to be adjusted, its angle, its position is able to be tweaked, um, in order that only a very specific wavelength of light will be refracted enough to pass to the detector. So you notice that over here, so we've got the lens and then these wavelengths pass to the prism. But you notice that these were three representative um, rays of light, that um, only one of them actually passes through this, ga this gap in the detector. Okay, or it's called a photomultiplier tube. Let's see if I'll write that in there. Photomultiplier tube. Okay, so what we have is that the, the monochromator, by, by the exact kind of tweaking the position of the prism, allows only that middle uh, ray of light to pass through this narrow gap and hit the back of the detector. Okay, all the other ones that we don't want to detect are deflected off the side. 
Now, what happens if we want to then pick up this one, then the prism, its position would be shifted slightly so that then that particular um, ray of light would be the one that passes through and the rest would deflect. The idea is that it allows us to be selective about which signal we're picking up. Because essentially the detector that we have at the end here, our photomultiplier tube, functions like an amplifier for an electric guitar, for example. Okay, it takes the signal, the very tiny amount of signal from the vibration of the strings, and then it amplifies it way up so that it's very easily heard. So it takes a tiny thing and it amplifies it. This does the same thing. The idea is that it takes a little kind of electrical signal that hits at the back of that detector and amplifies it right up um, so to, to a signal that we can then easily detect. So that's why it's called a photomultiplier tube, is that it takes that little bit of light that hits it and multiplies the signal so that it's detectable by us. Okay, so we're producing the wavelengths we need, we're passing it through our atomized sample, and then we're focusing and selecting our beams, our, our particular rays, so that then we can get the right signal at the other end. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're now going to start to think about, okay, well, um, you know, how can we use AAS? You know, why are some of the things of AAS such a good technique? Okay, so just pause for a moment. All right, so now we're going to start to think about the applications or the uses of AAS in the anal analysis of trace elements and why the, the way we set up this technique makes it particularly suitable. The first technique, the first aspect that we're going to um, we're going to, to broach is this idea of sensitivity. So in analytical chemistry, sensitivity re, um, relates to um, how small an amount, or how small a quantity can be detected. Uh, can be detected by the technique. Because the thing is that it's like, um, okay, think of an analogy like if you're at a restaurant, okay, or maybe you're out at the food court, um, you know, at the shops or something like that, and you're trying to have a conversation with someone, okay? Now, when there's very few people around, that conversation is really easy. You can talk at a very normal volume without any hassle. You can be heard, you can be understood, and you can understand the other person very easily. However, you go there on a Saturday morning just before Christmas, um, it's a very different story. Very busy, lots of conversations, lots of noise. Um, it's very hard to, to pick up that conversation accurately by comparison. You know, and then perhaps you take it to the extreme of going out to a really, a really noisy kind of club or a restaurant or somewhere like that where you practically have to shout to be heard or you have to shout directly into someone's ear and even then they probably don't hear you properly. Okay, so we, in chemistry we see the same sort of thing, is that when you're trying, if you're looking at a sample and there's no other things that kind of are, are contaminating it or no other things that are, are being picked up and you've got a high level of that substance, um, it's really easy to detect and you can get a really clear signal as to exactly how much of that substance is there or the fact that it's present. But when you start to add in other complex components, um, or you're starting to look for really small levels, um, you know, like a whisper in a restaurant as opposed to a shout, then it becomes a lot harder to pick out from the background. And so, in analytical chemistry, we're interested in how sensitive is the technique? How small an amount can we pick out, um, can we distinguish from the background um, because of this technique? And so the thing is that if we used, um, if we used kind of a normal lamp um, with um, AAS, it's not very sensitive. Because what we're getting is we're getting a whole lot of extra wavelengths detected. Okay, that our light source is producing a huge number of different wavelengths. There may be a whole lot of other atoms that are, um, are in our sample that are going to be absorbing those things and so we get a, it's a massive noisy environment. You're getting a very little chance of picking out the sample that you're looking for. or well, not with any accuracy anyway. But if we use an, um, an atomic emission lamp, all of a sudden our sensitivity goes way up. Because what we can do is that then it means that we're only picking out the, the atom that we're looking for, which means that our, no, our background noise is very, very small uh, by comparison. So that means that we can pick out much smaller levels using this kind of lamp than we can if we use a normal lamp. Because um, we can pick it out from the background much more easily. It's like if someone's whispering to you in a silent room, it's very different than if they're whispering to you in a noisy restaurant. Okay, and so that means that we all of a sudden, well, that by using this particular approach, we have a much better chance of analysing trace elements, which is uh, elements that are existing in very small quantities in a sample. Okay, so it means that 
by being, able, being more sensitive that we can be used to pick out trace elements such as like lead, um, you know, we might look for mercury or cadmium. I mean, these are heavy metals. It doesn't have to be only that, that you know, but, but that's particularly useful. If we want to check and see the, the lead levels in a sample of water to see if it's toxic for people to, to consume, we want to pick, use a technique that's going to pick out very small concentrations of lead, as opposed to only when it's at a really high level already, in which case it's dangerous. Okay, so the more sensitive it can be, the better the technique works. Okay, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.